Eastroid Energy is committed to providing its customers with safe, reliable, and convenient natural gas. It's also committed to offering new energy solutions to support Nova Scotia's transition toward net zero emissions. They have what it takes to deliver energy solutions that are clean, sustainable, and affordable, like green hydrogen, renewable natural gas, and natural gas heat pumps. I'd like to welcome you to Derek Estabrook. He's the Vice President of Marketing and Business Development at Eastwood Energy. Hi, welcome, Derek. Nice to be here. Great to have you today. I, in the introduction, I talked about how Eastward Energy, you're really uh, pivoting or transitioning, you know, towards, um, you know, how natural gas, you know, is, is vital to helping Nova Scotia transition to a low carbon economy. So could you explain that a little bit more? Sure. Um, fundamentally, because Nova Scotia uses a lot of energy and today, less than 15% of that energy is clean. But to transition to a low carbon economy, we're gonna need a lot more energy that's clean. And we're also gonna need a lot more en energy that's able to meet our diverse and growing energy needs, while also being reliable and available when we need it and affordable. Um, we also use many different types of energy. And while electricity is really important, the reality is today, electricity only meets about one quarter of Nova Scotia's energy needs. Uh, we also use energy for many different purposes, like for transportation or for heating buildings or for industry. And while some of these energy uses can be electrified relatively easily, others like uh, heavy transportation or certain industrial applications or even heating some larger and older buildings is going to be much more difficult to electrify. So when we think about getting to a low carbon economy, you know, we're going to have to reduce emissions significantly. And today, over 70% of Nova Scotia's emissions come from just two sectors, transportation and building. So we won't be able to get to net zero until we can figure out how to decarbonize both of these sectors. And that will include you know, large and, and, and old buildings that may be difficult to heat with electric heat pumps, and we'll also have to decarbonize sectors of transportation like large trucks and buses and trains and, and, and marine vessels that likely will be difficult to power with batteries alone. So we believe that you know, even with a clean electric grid and even with a lot more you know, electric heat pumps and electric vehicles and, and even with more energy efficiency and conservation, Nova Scotia is also going to need other types of sustainable energy. And we think the natural gas distribution system is going to have an important role to play. So then you think, okay, what will that role be? And so how can it help? Um, we think it can help by distributing new sources of low carbon energy, like renewable natural gas and green hydrogen that can be used to decarbonize some of these hard to abate sectors. And the natural gas distribution system is also incredibly resilient, which will be you know, very important to support our electric grid, which is you know, vulnerable to power outages caused by storms, which unfortunately are likely to become more frequent and more severe in the future. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely, because, and you, you, all those key points that you mentioned, and you can tell because when you go to your website, you know, you have an entire section that's dedicated to integrated energy systems. So can you tell me what, what is an integrated energy system is? I'll do my best. Okay. And uh, maybe, maybe before I describe what an integrated energy system is comprised of, yeah. it may help if I start by describing the energy system we've had, we've had for the last several decades that's not yeah. really integrated at all. Okay. So to, to illustrate... Consider how we heated our homes in Nova Scotia 20 or 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, how we still heat many of those homes today. 
a home might have been heated with a furnace or a boiler that was fueled by oil, or it may have used electric baseboard heaters, or maybe the home was even heated with, with wood. The oil likely came from the Middle East or other parts of North America and then transported here by ship or by pipeline. Mm -hmm. The electricity, while probably produced here, was likely generated in a coal or oil-fired uh, plant using fuel that was imported here from somewhere else. And wood probably came from the wood pile out in your backyard. Hmm. And all of these different types of fuel were similar in that they were sort of brought here, often from far away, but they could also be stored in large quantities for, for long periods of time until they were needed, typically in the winter. And all of these fuel sources were also dispatchable, meaning as much supply as was needed, you know, could always be available to meet immediate demand, which would go up or down depending on the outside temperature. So on really cold days, you know, lots of coal or oil could be burned to produce a lot of electricity. Um, enough heating oil for, you know, a month or more can be stored in an oil tank at your house and then used directly in your furnace or boiler. Or you could throw more wood in your wood stove to crank right. up the heat. So what we didn't have, we didn't really have to match energy production with demand in real time because we could long we could use long duration you know fuel storage to fill the gap and this is fundamentally why fossil fuels have been the backbone of our energy system for over a century but then if we look ahead 20 or 25 years toward a low carbon energy system the backbone of which will be mostly clean or renewable energy mm -hmm. and this system will have to be much different than the one I just described because to get to net zero emissions, we'll need to completely transform how all of our energy is produced and stored and distributed and used. So a new integrated energy system will be comprised of a few different components. There'll be low carbon energy like renewable electricity and low carbon gases, including renewable natural gas, hydrogen and biofuels. It will still have energy infrastructure like pipes and wires and energy storage, but it'll also have new, more en energy efficient technologies like electric vehicles, and they'll mm -hmm. be both battery electric and fuel cell electric. We'll also have heat pumps and hybrid heating systems. And all of these parts will have to work together in very complementary ways to optimize energy production, uh, short and long-term storage, distribution and consumption in ways that can create a much more efficient and sustainable energy system. And you know, this more integrated system should also be able to address the challenges that will be associated with the, the intermittent, intermittent nature of many renewable energy sources while still providing kind of energy solutions for some of these sectors that are going to be hard to, to decarbonize like industry and heavy transportation. Hmm. Interesting. What would you say are the three key benefits uh, of an integrated energy system? Well, I'd say that perhaps the most important benefit of an integrated en energy system is that it may be the only or at least the most feasible you know, and resilient and most affordable way for Nova Scotia to get to net zero. Hmm. As we start electrifying more energy uses like heating, transportation, and industrial processes, peak electric demand is projected to increase significantly, especially on cold winter days. Uh, Canada's energy regulator recently projected that Atlantic Canada's electricity demand is going to grow by over 60% by 2050. And just to put that in, in, in context, to keep pace with that amount of, of demand growth, we would need to build another hydroelectric facility the size of Muskrat Falls every five years for the next two decades. So an integrated energy system can also help to mitigate the projected increase in peak electric demand 
by using some low carbon energy technologies that can complement electrification, think like gas heat pumps uh, that work, work much like electric heat pumps to provide space heating and, and hot water for buildings. Uh, the system will also include hybrid heating systems that kind of they combine an electric heat pump with a backup furnace or boiler with a smart controller that connects the two and can switch from the electric heat pump to the uh, to the backup furnace or boiler during cold temperatures to help reduce peak electric demand. And this will ultimately lower the amount of new electric generating capacity that would otherwise be needed to meet increasing peak demand. Um, one of the other things that a more integrated system does is it can optimize the use of both wires to distribute electricity and pipes to deliver gases, whether that's natural gas or renewable natural gas or green hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And it will be more resilient because almost all of the natural gas infrastructure is located underground where it isn't vulnerable to severe weather events. And so as a result, a, a typical natural gas customer in Nova Scotia only experiences uh, a one hour service outage uh, once every 70 years. So it's a very resilient system. Mm. Um, an integrated en energy system will also be able to decarbonize these sectors that will be difficult to abate directly with electricity, like heavy transportation and high temperature industrial processes. And we'll do this by converting renewable electricity into green hydrogen that can provide low carbon energy that can be used in these sectors. Mm. As we think about heavy transportation as an example, it will be one of our biggest decarbonization challenges. Here in Nova Scotia, we use about 700 million liters of diesel fuel every year mostly for trucking and transit and marine applications. And while some of these heavy vehicles can be electrified with batteries, probably hydrogen fuel cells will be a, a, a more practical zero emission alternative for applications like long haul trucking or trains or long transit routes and even some marine vessels. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, you know, we've had past, previous guests who's, who said the same thing about hydrogen. It's it's really great uh, applied to heavy uh, transportation, you know, that sort of thing. Um, energy storage and linked electricity and, and, and gas grids, you know, they'll be important components of a more integrated energy system, uh, like you just explained. So can you tell me how energy storage and linked electricity and gas grids will help increase the supply of low carbon energy? Sure. Um, well, much of the projected increase in clean electric uh, generation in no Nova Scotia will be from renewable sources like wind and solar that are intermittent, meaning you know, they produce electricity only when the wind is blowing or only when the sun is shining. And adding significantly more intermittent generation is going to create challenges as we try to align electric supply and, and demand. If we have too much supply, uh, that can result in electricity being, uh, you know, more electricity being generated than the grid can handle. And so when intermittent generation exceeds demand, that surplus power must be either stored or curtailed. Mm -hmm. so in reading, um, Nova Scotia's 2030 Clean Power Plan, for example, it calls for the addition of over 1,600 megawatts of new wind and solar generation on an electric grid that today has capacity of about 2,800 megawatts. So, you know, huge growth. Mm -hmm. And while you know, new battery storage can help balance short-term supply and demand, uh, Nova Scotia Power's latest integrated resource plan um, forecasts that 30 or 40 percent or even more of that potential generation from wind and solar may need to be curtailed due to a combination of uh, fa factors but essentially because there'll be times of year like in the spring and the fall when the available supply of power will significantly exceed demand we think that instead of curtailing surplus renewable electricity generation we should be using it. So, you know, we can use 
that surplus renewable electricity produced to produce green hydrogen through electrolysis. And that hydrogen can be stored for days or weeks or even months to complement batteries that are really good at storage, but only for a short duration, like a few hours or a couple of days. And as we think about a climate like ours, that's always mm -hmm. going to be you know, colder in the winter than the summer. That means we're always going to need more energy in the winter than we do in the summer. So this long duration energy storage will be really important. And you know that is one of the benefits of fo fossil fuels. You know they can be stored for indefinite period of time to ensure that we always have enough supply of the energy we need to meet demand. Interesting. Well, you had just mentioned a minute ago. You know, one of the biggest challenges as we move forward, you know, with net zero emissions by 2050, will be balancing, you know, the growing supply and demand for clean electricity. So how is Eastward Energy planning to help address, you know, that challenge? Hmm. Well, I'd say first it's important to distinguish bet between demand for electricity during an interval of time, like a month or a year, and, and peak demand, which is the amount of electricity needed at the moment in time when demand for electricity is the greatest, mm -hmm. uh, typically you know, on the coldest day of the winter. And meeting peak, peak electric demand will actually be a much bigger challenge than meeting monthly or yearly demand. We usually think about energy efficiency in terms of saving kilowatt hours of electricity, which is important for an electricity user because every kilowatt hour saved you know, saves you 17 cents. Right. But reducing demand for electricity by one kilowatt hour, especially if that kilowatt hour was saved during a time of lower demand, like in the spring or the fall, doesn't really help the utility the electric utility much, or certainly not nearly as much as reducing peak demand, um, which you know as we start um, you know electrifying more more building heat, you know the demand for electricity on that coldest hour of the coldest day of the year is going to go up significantly. Mm -hmm. So we think you know electric heat pumps, you know they're a great. Uh, way to heat a building most of the time. You know, they are efficient and they can heat a building very efficiently most days. But on the coldest winter days, the coefficient of performance of most heat pumps declines at the very same time that demand for heat is increasing because it's really, really cold. And this causes peak electric demand to, to spike. And that's why new energy technologies like gas heat pumps and, and hybrid heating systems and fuel cells will have a really important role to help mitigate that in, increase in, in peak demand. Exactly. Now, what is next for, for Eastward Energy? I know that you're, you're in, in the news uh, in a positive way. Um, so tell me, tell me what's going on, what's happening in the next little while. Well, there's a lot happening. Uh, we're working to bring many of the sustainable energy solutions that we've been talking about for the last few minutes to mm -hmm. life. And, you know, th we think these are energy solutions that Nova Scotia is going to need to get to net zero emissions. Uh, we're undertaking a significant project right now to test several different types of natural gas heat pumps for different types of buildings, ranging from you know, multi-unit residential buildings um, all the way down to smaller single family homes. We're also starting some work with some other energy stakeholders here in the province to look at how hybrid heating systems can support the electrification of building heat by helping to mitigate peak electric demand. And maybe the most exciting project that we're working on is uh, the development of a proposed green hydrogen project here in Halifax that will produce hydrogen that can be blended into our natural gas distribution system. Mm -hmm. And hydrogen from this facility could also be used um, uh, in the heavy transportation sector. So we can deliver that hydrogen through our pipes and then used in fuel cell vehicles and heavy transportation sector, like at the port of Halifax or at Halifax Transit. And you may have heard that Halifax Transit has committed to transitioning its full fleet of over 300 diesel buses 
to a zero emission bus fleet by 2030. And that will likely be achieved through a combination of battery electric buses and also uh, high hydrogen fuel cell uh, buses too. So I guess I would conclude by saying it's, it's really impossible to predict exactly how Nova Scotia and the rest of Canada is going to get to net zero. Uh, but we're confident that whatever way that is, that uh, Eastwood Energy is going to have an important role to play. Excellent. And I wish you all the best in, in the upcoming year. I know that exciting uh, changes, you know, are, are ahead and uh, it's all for the good, all for net zero. And it's nice to hear your, you and your company are, are doing all you can to, to move that needle. Uh, forward. Thank you. I've enjoyed our chat today. Thanks for joining me. Now you have an understanding of the role that Eastward Energy wants to take in supporting Nova Scotia's transition to net zero. Thank you, Derek, for explaining the components of an integrated energy system and the role of energy storage. Join me on the next episode. And speaking of episodes, these are sponsored by Smart Energy Halifax a clean technology event that's now open for registration. I appreciate your time today. Join me next time. In the meantime, I'm Maria McGowan.